Today is April 25th, 2013, and we're located at the Hillcrest Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia, as part of the Veterans Oral History Project. Today, in conjunction with the United States Library of Congress and the Augusta Richmond County Historical Society, we're going to hear the story of Crawford Hicks, a veteran of the Army Air Force who served in World War II. My name is Stan Schrader, and I'll conduct the interview, and I'll be assisted by Bill Till. Uh, first of all, Mr. Hicks, we want to thank you for coming and participating in this project. Let's start off by you telling us a little bit, a little bit about your early life, where you were born, where you grew up, and so forth. Fine. I was born February the 10th of 1921 in Litchfield, Kentucky, which is in southwestern Kentucky. I uh, lived in Kentucky to, at the Alterwood, which was out uh, outside of Louisville, until I was about 13 years old, and then moved to Fern Creek, where I finished high school. I went to uh, lower uh, high school in Anchorage as well as Fern Creek, Kentucky. Finished at Fern Creek in 1939, and went to University of Louisville for one semester, and then I dropped out of school and worked for a while. After that, then the um, the uh, 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 Pearl Harbor occurred, and I knew they were going to war. I needed to go that I'd be, be involved, and I always wanted to fly anyway. And so I said, I want to go into the Air Corps and learn to fly. Uh, as a matter of interest, uh, Charles A. Lindbergh flew the ocean when I was only six years old, and he was my idol, and I was remembering. So I was able to get into the Army Air Corps, and I joined in, in uh, March of 1942. Okay. Tell us about tell us about the training program that you went through. Well, after getting in, first uh, getting actually going to active duty, which was in July of uh, 1942, I went to indoctrination learning uh, what a soldier was and so forth, and then went to Maxwell Air Force Base, where I learned the the, the ground school such as meteorology, learned the Morse code, learned to march, did a lot of physical training. And then I learned uh, 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 military courtesy and things of that sort. No flying? No flying at that point, no, none at all. How about weather and navigation? Did you get a little bit of navigation? No, we didn't even get in an, in an airplane during that time. This is all ground school, Okay. just learning learning the rudiments of, of military. And how long was that, a couple months? Uh, about a one month, about okay. one month. Okay. Then where? Went to... Uh, uh, Albany, Georgia to Dar Aerotech. Dar was a private flying school in Albany, Georgia, and had been um, taken over by the Air Corps. And so I was went down there to learn to learn to fly, to start my flight training. Uh, it's called primary training. The airplane I flew was a, a PT-17, a Stearman. This was a biplane that means two wings with two open cockpits, meaning there was no canopy over the cockpits. So, and we wore helmets and goggles, just like Snoopy and, and, uh, and the sexy little fellow that he was, but we thought we were something. Um, my, this was the first, my first ride in the airplane to be taught how to fly an airplane. Well, it was the first time in an airplane. So I was apprehensive. And then when I got into the, into the air with the instructor in front of me, I was even more apprehensive because the sounds was, uh, were, were rather rather uh, intimidating. The smells were different, the noises were there, and so the whole world had changed. And he was doing various maneuvers to show me how the airplane worked. And one of them was to do a stall. That's a maneuver where you pull the power off and, and the airplane falls down because it doesn't have enough speed to fly anymore. Well, when he did a stall, my stomach went up into my mouth, just like you do in the back seat of a car when, when it goes over a bump, and I, I, I froze on the controls. And he could feel me. He couldn't even move the controls. So he, he could also talk to me. I could not talk to him, but he could talk to me and see me in his mirror. So he said, Hicks, now you got to do what I tell you. And is your seat belt on? I nodded, mm-hmm. Is your... Um, Parachute button? Yes, I did. Yes, it is okay. Now do what I tell you to. He turned that airplane upside down. We were about 5,000 feet above Albany, Georgia. About, and, it's, and this was even more frightening. He said, now put your hands above your head. 
and he made me do that. I knew that if I wanted to fly, and if I wanted to get through this thing, I had to do what he told me. Well, I did, and as the old expression goes, it, it stopped me from sucking eggs. From then on, I was happy as I could be in an airplane, but this was my first flight. Yeah, okay. Did you make any of those tight little circles with that, with that uh, steerman? Oh, many, oh yes, we no, did. No, I'm talking about ground loops. <laughs> well, yes, as a matter of fact, we had a requirement that we would land, made three, made, make three landings a day for three successive days in order to, uh, to be considered to fly solo. Um, this was about, oh, I think seven, I had about seven hours of training or something. On the first day, the, the landing gear on the stairman was very narrow, but I never could land an airplane anyway, but so I can't make excuses, but very narrow. And on the first day, uh, I landed and the wing, and I couldn't keep it straight on the runway, and when the wing went down, and I finally made a, a real broad circle on the grass and put grass stain on the wing wingtip. Well, they, they said, well, it's not bad. So in the, on the third landing of the third day, I did the same thing to the other wingtip. They say, well, it's not too bad. We need pilots, so you're, you can go ahead and pass. So I did pass, and, um, and I had about 60 hours. 60 before, hours, okay. Yeah, right there. All right, then where? Went to Greenville, Mississippi. That's right on the Mississippi River. And if you haven't flown over the Mississippi, you're in for uh, an interesting time because the river at that point is nothing but a series of S's goes back and forth. The fact that the river runs north almost as much as it runs south at that point because of the meandering of the river, but they ran on the river. And there I flew a BT-13, there's a Volte, a Volte airplane, we call it the Vol Volte vibrator because it shook so much when you did things. But we learned uh, aerobatics and, and how to do snap rolls and spins and turns and a lot and did some formation flying and a lot of, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, cross-country flying to learn how to read maps from the air because the ground looks much different from the air than it does from the ground. But that's what we did there, about and 60 hours. Not another 60 hours. Right. All right, then where? Then we went to Greenville, Mrs. Greenville, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 Vincennes, Indiana, which is on the, uh, what's the name of that river? I forget the name of it. Uh, it was Vincennes, Indiana, which was uh, Lawrenceville, Illinois, so it was an air base right across the river. Went to um, to twin engine training there. Now, prior um, uh, when leaving um, a basic training, they asked us what we were going to do. We wanted to buy do multi engine or single engine, and I wanted to go into multi engine, so they put me at that base to learn how to fly more than one engine in the airplane. We had twin engines in the airplane, AT-10 was the, was the plane. Incidentally, the combined horsepower of those two engines was the same as the, was single, the horsepower in the single engine of, of the uh, Volte BT-13. But I had about 60 hours there, and then I graduated from flying school and was given my commission and my wings. And that was in April 29th, 1943? That's correct, that's okay. correct. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, so what did, what did the, the Army Air Force do with a brand new second lieutenant, twin engine uh, pilot, uh, after, after you left Vincennes, Indiana? Well, I had a short leave, and then I went to uh, Lockburn Air Force Base in Ohio. Lockburn was out, outside of Columbus, and uh, they had B-17s, and I went there for what they called B-17 transition. Now, the B-17 had a wingspan of 103 feet which was a huge thing, had four engines. It was called a Flying Fortress, and it was a very um, romantic airplane at its time, too. But um, went there, and we. my job was to learn to fly the airplane. The first time I saw it, I thought I'd never handle it, never could. But the instructor had me do it. He made me get sit in the left seat, and he made me do everything, and pretty soon I was able to make the airplane do what I wanted it to do. I could land it, I could I could do anything I wanted to with it, it would do. So I enjoyed the airplane. How, how many hours about did you get when you were flying down there? Uh, uh, maybe 50 or 60, not, okay. not too many. Just to learn the airplane, that's yeah. my job. Yeah. Because okay. this is going to be the first pilot job. Okay. Then where? Then went to Piot uh, uh, Army Airfield, 
which was in Texas. That's 200 miles due east of El, east of El Paso, and in right in the middle of rattlesnakes and and, uh, and oil wells. Matter of fact, we take off at night there sometime, and have to go on the instruments because the with no with no stars, or no with the stars up there and no uh, no lights on the ground. The lights that you could see were all oil flares, and they looked like, like stars, so you almost had to go on instruments in order to fly. But we did that and learned this is where I got my crew. Uh, my crew, we had a the total of 10 people on the airplane, two pilots, the navigator, bombardier, a flight engineer, a uh, radio operator, a ball turret gunner, two waste gunners, and a tail gunner. A total, total of 10 people. And we acquired that that uh, group of people while we were there at Bio. So you put together your crew. That's correct. It was going to go overseas, right there. That's right. That okay. is correct. Okay. And then our flying there consisted of a lot of uh, of uh, formation flying, of uh, cross country flying, bombing, practice bombings. We practiced at night and, and especially in the daytime too, to, to teach the bombardier how to drop bombs. We used the Norden bomb site, which was top secret. But very very good, and uh, uh, we did. We were pretty successful. We we had pretty good training. And this was daytime and nighttime. Daytime and nighttime. Uh -huh. That's right. Yes. Tell me how. Tell me real quick how that works with the Norden bomb site when you're getting ready when you're getting close to the target. How it would between uh, well, the bombardier that's, that's, and the pilot. It's interesting because uh, with the Norden bomb site, uh, the bombardier had the was uh, had the requirement to take over control of the airplane when it reached a certain point in proximity to the, to the um, target. So and the takeover meant that he had, we, the pilot would they put the airplane on automatic pilot and the bombardier had controls on his bomb site where he could change the direction and the altitude of the airplane slightly to make it do what the bomb site told him he had to do in order to drop the bombs on a particular target. So the bombardier would take over the control of the airplane for a short period of time on what we call the bomb run. And that's what happened. Okay. So he actually takes over control of he the took, airplane and, and, right. and flies it until he that's drops exactly the bombs right. and, then, and he, then you got it again. He flew it as far as altitude and direction was concerned, yes. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, you guys did some. Uh, you said you told us machine gun training, uh, towed targets and stuff like that. While yes, you were we, down we there. shot at targets. Yes, and uh, and and uh, uh, formation flying. Yep, did formation flying. Navigation training, right? Of yep. various kinds. Yes. How about the link trainer? Tell me about the link trainer. Well, the link trainer is a is a, a simulated flight. It's a simulated flight instrument. Uh, it's built so that it can simulate the kinds of conditions that a pilot meets when he's flying uh, uh, under uh, in weather conditions when he can't see the ground. This is called blind flying. And so they put us in this enclosed cockpit and then simulate conditions so that we would have to uh, put our, we would have to learn to believe our controls is really what it amounted to. We would have to make the airplane do what it is supposed to be doing on the, on the screen we saw in front of us. But that's how we learned to fly at night, blind flying. Okay, and uh, you liked flying the B-17, didn't you? I mean, it was... We loved it. It was, it was such a, a wonderful airplane, easy to fly, uh, I believe, and I've said this many times, we always had a co-pilot with us, but that it was capable of being flown solo if a person had to, because it was so user-friendly. It was easy to fly and very stable. Yeah. And easy to land, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, did you guys actually drop live bombs while you were there? Uh, well, no, we dropped, uh, they were dummy bomb, but they did have a little explosive in them uh, so that the, the uh, we would uh, have a, uh, take pictures, of course, of the bombs as they dropped so that we could see how accurate our, our work was to see how good it was. So these bombs would have a, a light explosive in them, so a flare, if you will, so that you could uh, pictures we take and see how well you did on the yeah. bomb run. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how long were you guys doing that crew training together before you picked up your plane? Uh, well, we didn't get the plane until the end of our all of our training. Uh, well, I guess we were there for 
a, a couple of months okay. doing all that, and and we did. Uh, we had even the pilots had to uh, shoot, uh, try to shoot the uh, do skeet shooting, and I was a miserable figure at that because I couldn't. I have all the training I had, I never hit a skeet. Never <laughs> couldn't do it because I didn't understand it. But you think about it, you have to fire. You're moving, and you're trying to hit another moving object. And uh, and you can't even see where the guns you're you're shooting are going. It's very difficult to yeah. hit, yeah. but that's what we did. Yeah. Okay, tell me about picking up the new airplane. Okay, we finished there. We went from from Piot to uh, our next phase, which was in uh, Del Delhart, Texas, in the Panhandle, and we were there until the end of December of 1944, and then we were sent to Kearney, Nebraska. It's K-E-A-R-N-E-Y, Nebraska, which was a staging center. Now, uh, the airplane, the B-17, was made by Boeing, and so Boeing would ferry an airplane from their factory out in, in Washington over to Kearney, and then we'd pick, up, they'd pick it up. Uh, I was very proud of the fact that the, the, the powers that be, the authorities, gave me a brand new airplane and had me sign my name for it. Here it is, Hicks, it's yours. You know, the quarter of a million dollar airplane at that point had, had six flying hours on it already, just like a brand new car. Anyway, we took it up and, and the crew, we went up and, and test flight and just flew it just to see how, how it worked and how, how it felt. Um, I got it up to 35,000 feet, which was above its, uh, its ceiling. 30,000 was usually the ceiling, but it started getting a little mushy, so I came on back down. So we, we had a good time playing with it. Okay, uh, uh, now they reconfigured that airplane a little bit with uh, with fuel tanks, right? Because you were getting ready to fly oh, yes, across the pond. Yeah, good point, yes. Because we were going to fly across, as you said, yes. So they took, the, the, the airplane has had a had bomb bay in which there were two compartments, a left and a right. So they took the bomb racks out of one of the compartments and uh, put uh, gasoline tanks in the compartment so that it, to extend our range. So we had those airplanes, and so we flew our airplane to uh, to Presque Isle, Maine, which is in the very northern part of Maine, and uh, uh, spent the night. And we had to fly, and we flew to Goose Bay, Labrador, the next day. But the weather was bad all the way down. Thirty, we flew in at thirty thousand feet, and the weather was socked in. We called it the fog all the way down to the ground. So we had to come back, and we landed at. Uh, at uh, in uh, New Hampshire, uh, I forget the, the, the Grenier Field, New Hampshire, and spent the night there, or some time there, and then flew back up to Goose Bay again. When we landed at Goose Bay, the the uh, snow was piled so as high as the tail of the B-17. That's 17 feet high, so it's piled piled pretty high. We stayed there a while. I had to get some medical taken care of, medical things taken care of. And then we took off one morning about 3 o'clock to fly uh, to England. Now, we took this to Goose Bay, Labrador, and we took off and flew the Great Southern, Southern Route, which is what you do when you're going around the, 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 uh, the globe. We flew to the south of, uh, of uh, Greenland, and incidentally, um, interesting, I was only about um, uh, 40 years, 30 years early, because had I been 30 years later, I would have waved at my son, who was stationed at uh, at Greenland at uh, 30 years ago. Anyway, but we passed Greenland and went on to Iceland, where I uh, landed and spent the night. Iceland is right at the Arctic Circle, and but it has a lot of uh, of uh, uh, volcanic action there, and there's a lot of hot hot streams. And uh, this was the first of April of 1944. And uh, we, we got out of the airplane, took our jackets off. It was that warm. But it was the 1st of April. <clears throat> we stayed up there all night, gassed up, took off for Ireland. And um, the navigator had uh, got her course set for Ireland and everything was okay. So I told him to hang it up and I'd, I'd go and fly by, by a radio compass. So I set the compass for Ireland where he had told me to say how he told me to set it. And I watched it, and I noticed that the compass was swinging, the needle was swinging more and more to the south. And uh, so uh, and this happened after a while, and I checked, had him check it, 
and we were off course by a goodly amount because my compass had gone bad. Something had gone wrong, made it swing south. And we figured that the Germans had bent the radio signal, causing us to look like we were going toward our, our target, our, our destination, but we weren't. But nothing else happened. We got to to, so, to Ireland and they took my airplane and to modify it further for combat. And I went on into my base. Which was that? At the uh, Pole Brook. This was the 351st Bomb Group. Uh, and this is Triangle J, was the, which was the first air division. 351st Bomb Group and 509th Bomb Squadron. Now this is May of 44. In May of 44, okay. that's right. Alright, your first mission. Scary. Uh, first of all, I was scared, no question. And uh, and I was, then, but they wanted to see if I could handle it, so they had me fly co-pilot with a flight. And I flew on a person's wing that day and, and uh, flying, doing fine, and we bombed the what we call ski jumps on the coast of France. France was only about 25 miles away from England. Remember, this was before D-Day, so this was the front line. But we got over there and all of a sudden I saw flak coming up. Flak is the, the ground fire that uh, they about the 88 millimeter shells come up and they were having an explosive charge in them and they set the fire to explode about where the airplane is. So I saw all these shells coming up at me and the, and I could see them and, and feel some of the really the pellets hitting us. And uh, I, was, I was so scared, I almost got sick. But I had to fly the airplane, I had to do it because, you know, this was a test for me. So I did it and uh, I got through all right. Yeah. And the ski jump with the, with the V-2 rocket launching that sites, is, right? That is correct, yeah, yeah. the V-2. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's why it was important as a target. Yeah. And keep in mind, it's only 25 miles away. You know, that's no not, not, nothing distance yeah. to a small yeah. amount. All right. And you said you told me that you never came back without an airplane with holes in that's it from right. the flag. I had 10 missions and every one of them had at least one hole in them from flak or most of them from flak. But some fighters, but most of them flak. Yeah. Flak is those, those guns. All right. You told me that you made it to Berlin four times. That was a long that's ways right. away, it wasn't was. it? it uh, our my missions were usually oh, four to five hours uh, from start to finish. But Berlin trip was eight hours because you take off and you have to form and get your formation set up. And then you, you take a devious route to get there to miss the flak emplacements on the ground. So on a Berlin trip was eight hours. But to make matters worse, now this was, this was in, um, in, in, in May of 1944, before D-Day, Make matters worse, we did not have airplane, uh, pursuit airplanes, fighter airplanes to accompany us all the way. Uh, we had P-47s part of the way, and then 38s once in a while, and then P-51s for part of the way. But when we got close to Berlin, we had no fighter protection, none, all by ourselves. And so this is why we had to keep good, tight formation so that our guns on our airplane, we had 10 guns on each airplane, could uh, keep the fighters away, hopefully. But uh, so this is why we had so many guns. Yeah. And then we did this. Okay. Tell me about the formation that you guys were flying. Okay. The uh, we bombed as a group. A group was uh, consisted of 18 airplanes, and the, the uh, group also had uh, three squadrons, each of which had six airplanes. These squadrons were positioned one in the lead, one to the high and to the right, and the other to the low and to the left. And each, that's how the, the squadrons were positioned in the group. Now within each squadron you had flights. You had a, each flight, we had three airplanes, you had three flights in front, and three, uh, three airplanes in front and three in the back. So this is how we had our 18 airplanes. We got, we f flew close formation, this allowed us to have all the guns to come to bear on enemy fighters if we had them, and also it helped us to give, get a, a good bomb pattern when we dropped our bombs. But this was our standard formation we flew. Yeah, so the closer you got together, the better your bomb pattern right. was when it, hit the, fly, when it hit the ground. We would fly nearly wingtip to wingtip, not that quite that tight, but merely wingtip to wingtip. Yeah, so you were wing telling me the story about uh, uh, the ME 109 that came in and came underneath you yeah. and then. And, and, a P-51 right after him or whatever. <laughs> well, is it, remember, remember this, that when we were 
flying without in without um, um, escort, we felt naked. And but this particular day, I was leading the the top element of the top squadron, of the the, the back three of the top squadron, and I was not in tight formation because I was just playing around. And um, I heard on the on the radio bandits at 12 o'clock uh, level. So uh, knowing that what that said was that the fighters were coming in uh, level at us straight on. Well, I, I poured the coal to the to the thing, and of course my wingmen did too. And we got up there, but on en route, we saw this ME 109, a Messerschmitt 109. This is an airplane that fires, that fires its uh, cannon, a 20 millimeter cannon through its, its propeller hub came right under our wing, on my left wing, and I could remember him to this day if he didn't have his mask on, if he hadn't had his mask on. He was that close. But right on his tail was the most beautiful P-51 fishtailing and shooting his guns, and it was it was a joy to see. Believe me, it was. I okay. remember still. Let, let me ask you about the actual procedure for dropping the bombs. Didn't you tell me that the lead airplane was the only one that had a Norton and and everybody else dropped the bombs when he did. well no yeah the lead and uh, 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 a deputy the deputy in case something happens to lead the lead someone else but uh, the other fellow would take over yes the Norton bomb site was top secret at the time it was so it was very very good because it could hit a target from six miles away imagine that six miles away dropping something through the air and you're going uh, 150 miles an hour. And the bombs are going the same speed when they drop, so they're going to go forward. They're not going straight down. They're going forward. So this this um, bomb site would core, would compute all these factors to see uh, uh, where the bombs were going to hit, and it did a pretty good job. So we had Norton bomb sites. The lead airplane and deputy had that, and it says they had the bombardier would lock in and take over control of the airplane. And then we all. When we saw the lead airplane drop its bombs, we would drop our bombs. That's how we got a good bomb pattern. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about the 30th of May, 1944. Okay. And uh, uh, um, near Oscherschleben. That's right. That was that was our that was our target that day. We were on our way home. Okay. In Oscherschleben. Yeah, I think that's in southwest uh, southeast Germany. I'm not real sure exactly where it is. But we had dropped our bombs, and we were on our way home here again. I was leading the low element of the low squadron that day, and I'm convinced to this day that they were aiming at the lead airplane and hit me by mistake, but that's one of either here nor there. But anyway, the, their ME 109, Messerschmitt 109, <coughs> and I could see the tracer bullets coming toward me, tracer shells, like because of the, the tracers they had on them. I couldn't duck or anything. I felt the about two, two of them hit my right wing and uh, put the two right engines on fire. I could smell the smoke coming into the cockpit. So I, we had uh, fire extinguishers in each engine, so I used the fire extinguishers, but I couldn't put the fire out. And also we feathered the props. Um, feathering means um, the propeller is like a big screw. It, uh, it goes through the air and, and <coughs> pulls, pulls the airplane through the air. But when you feather, you put the narrow end of the prop toward the front so it doesn't uh, obstruct the air. So I feathered the two right props and um, that so as to uh, not slow us down too much and started dropping out of formation. And while I was getting ready to see what we could do, try to fly it or, or keep everything's going, um, the bombardier came between the co-pilot and myself and the catwalk beneath. And they asked me what we were going to do, and I said, I'm trying to put the fire out. Just about that time, and the fighter made another pass and hit him with a, one of the 20 millimeter cells in his body someplace. And he he, he died instantly, I'm sure, because I could see blood rushing out of his mouth. Yeah. Uh, I gave the alarm for everybody to get out, and I had to get back in the seat to we keep the airplane straight, so then everybody got out and, and I trimmed it up and put the automatic pilot on the best it could, and then I got out myself. Here again, I was scared. I was scared. But we were, you know, funny thing, we were all very calm about it. We, were, we knew what to do. We had this good training and we knew we had to do certain things, and it's how you did it. So we did it. Yeah. I remember very clearly saying, thank you, Lord. I mean, give me, give me, and help me get through this. And he, he did, and I got out of the airplane, 
started tumbling and it uh, finally pulled the chute rip cord and, and the chute opened. I hit the ground. I said, thank you, Lord, for getting me here. I, this is clear. And then I thought, what? I was engaged at the time. But what will Rini, my, my fiancés, what will Rini and Mama think? Because I knew I was okay, but they didn't. Yeah. And you, you think about the hardship, the heart sick, heart, heart how heart sick a person is when one of their children is missing in action. Think about that. It's horrible. And that had came to my mind, hell, they're going to think about this. Yeah. But I was all right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it didn't take them long to, to police you up, did it? No. The that, that interesting thing, uh, uh, I thought, well, this is good. I'm, nobody's here. But I looked over the hill, up at the hill, and there was a policeman there on a motorcycle coming down, so he came on down, and, and for some reason or other, I'd heard that uh, that Germany in German in French in, in German in, in German language is is uh, Deutschland. So I pointed to the ground and said Deutschland, and he said yeah yeah, and I said point to him, are you Deutsch? No, I'm French. So I thought oh boy oh boy, I'm in the French on the ground. That wasn't true. He was he had been impressed in the German service, and he was coming to pick me up. So now this is a, I, I know I was under shock, but I had a I had a Zippo lighter with me. I was smoking at the time, and uh, he searched me and took my Zippo lighter, and and here again the shock that I was under. I stuck my hand out and looked him in the eye and I says, uh uh, give it back, and he did. He gave it back to me. He was as frightened of me as I was of him, but. Uh, so we got, he took me into this little town of Nienburg, Germany, which was near the Belgian border. And he started jumping up and down screaming about something or other to the local people. And I thought maybe he was talking about this lighter, so I gave it to him and he shut up and walked away. So he was happy. Well, the whole, your whole crew got out except, got out of the airplane except for the one guy that except was killed, right? Except for the bombardier, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, go ahead. Okay. Uh, they take you then to Frankfurt? No, they took me to a local local uh, military post and put me in jail overnight. Okay. And Tell then, me the story they, about the, the young girl that saw the airplane come down. Well, okay, this was uh, oh, not, about two years ago, three years ago, uh, because of, well, a man had gotten in touch with me about trying to get some information. He was at a museum, that kind of thing. He ran the airfield. And he put in a paper, I noticed in the paper asking if I'd seen the crash. And this young girl, about was eight or nine years old when this uh, when this crash occurred, she wrote me a letter. She was a school teacher, and wrote me a letter and said she had seen the airplane and came over their house and it almost hit in their house. And she was uh, he ran out because it was so close. But she sent a picture of the airplane and it was on his back with the wheel, on the wheel sticking up in the air. Yeah, and she had looked back and she saw two parachutes coming out. So apparently that was myself and maybe the the, the uh, radio operator. I'm not sure, yeah. but uh, so we still we're stayed in contact with her. Okay, uh, they take you to an interrogation thing uh, in Frankfurt. That was in Frankfurt. There are two Frankfurts, and I don't know which. I don't know which one this is. This is the one that's more in the. I don't know where it was, but it's Frankfurt. No, well, it's the, the, the one on the uh, Frankfurt on the Mine River. Is what, what yeah, was okay. yeah, the other one is further into East Germany. Yeah, okay. Well, so that was for Frankfurt. And they had, the Germans had tremendous amount of intelligence information about us. Um, uh, they, they knew so much about everything, what was going on. They knew the members, the members of my crew, their, their names. They looked at the tail markings, too, knew where I was from. And apparently they, had, they knew the members of the crew because they gave me the names. But uh, they, but we had an interesting thing happen. We had on the mission that day, we had been briefed to fly at a certain mission at a certain altitude, but the, uh, they changed, changed something and had, had us increase the altitude by 2,000 feet. By a big blackboard at the end of the runway as we took off, Angel Plus Two was on the runway on the blackboard. Um, I didn't know why they changed, but I don't mind. It's not the reason why. I managed to do what you're told to, so I did. But the, they kept a navigator at the interrogation center an extra day, trying to find out from him why we changed our altitude. Why? Not the fact we changed it, 
But why did we change it? Yeah. But they did. We had gotten some intelligence information apparently that caused us to do it. But that that, that was telling you that sign at the end of the runway was telling you to to add two thousand feet to the to the to the bombing to, the bombing to the, altitude. Yeah, yes. the brief the brief bombing altitude. That's correct. Yeah, uh -huh. that's yeah. right. Yeah. Huh. Okay. All right. So so the, the interrogation then was was not much. No, it wasn't. The other thing was rather intimidating. They had these Alsatian police dogs, and uh, they were good sized dogs, and they were standing in the in the doorway of the little office as we walked down the hall. They were, they were about two feet snarling right in there. And of course the handlers had them, but they, they were snarling at us. And you can be assured we were well, uh, well uh, you, you concerned. You behaved yourself, didn't you? We surely did, we surely did. How, you were telling me about uh, 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 how the civilians were treating you guys when they took okay. you to the airport there at Frank. After, leave, after leaving the uh, interrogation center, we went we were put on train and we went to a train station and this had been hit pretty badly with bombs and the windows broken out and there were civilians there, oh half a dozen or so who were spitting at us and, and you know, were making all sorts of nasty gestures and noises and but the guards took care of us and kept us uh, uh, and kept them away from us. Mm. But we were put on prison trains. These trains had uh, uh, bars on the windows. And we went from there to Stalag Luft 3, which is near Breslau, Poland. Uh, and we got there on something like the 7th or the 8th of June. Now, the 6th of June was D-Day. Uh, and uh, we had didn't know anything about it, but uh, this was one of the highlights of the whole time. We got there, and, uh, and you know how the, you have a, uh, um, uh, loading platform where you put supplies and things onto a train that's higher than the the, the uh, passenger level. Well, there's a loading platform there and this little, this German guard, about five foot two, just really not very nice looking. <laughs> uh, but he looked, had guns all on you know, and all these in uniform, had his, his hands on his hips and looking at us like, well, and here again, here prior to this time, we'd been hearing nothing Mock Schnell and and Rouse met him, and, and so we learned German real quick, and it wasn't very nice. But then he looked at us and he said, Jesus Christ, fellas, where are you guys from? And we all almost broke out in a cheer because here was somebody from home who had been hearing this German the invectives all this time, and here we're in the most beautiful Brooklynese you ever heard in your life. But he had been spent his life, or a lot of his life, in the United States and gone to England or to Germany rather to visit relatives and got checked impressed into the army and there he was. So he told us about D Day, which caused our morale to improve greatly. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Okay, so you're now at Stalag Left Three. Uh tell me a little bit about the camp. Okay. Uh those of you who've seen uh Hogan's Heroes have seen the the physical camp that they had uh, it's my understanding that their camp was modeled after ours, and it was. It looked it looked quite a bit like it. Uh, so uh, that's a, that was the type of, of buildings we had. There were uh, buildings off the, the ground that each uh, each building held oh how many people? Um, uh, two hundred. I don't know. Two hundred people. I'm guessing at that. We had rooms, and we had at first we had twelve people to a room. These people, these uh, people, uh, uh, slept three bunks into a bed, to a three, a three, three bunk beds in a tier, and we had four of those that for 12 people there. Uh, that's what we had to start with. Then in, in, in about in September of 44, we uh, added another bunk, another tier, so we had 15 men in a room, and there were about. Oh, uh, something like 200 men in a, in a building. Okay. What, what other did you have? You, you said you had a table in the, in the middle? Okay, we had a, had a one single eating table, which would hold uh, all 15 of us sitting by, all, you know, all 12 of us at first, and little stools, and uh, a little stove in the corner, and a very small locker, about, well, very, very, very small, to put whatever little things we had. Uh, but that uh, that was our eating facility. Now, the stove was there supposedly to cook, but we 
pooled our, our woods, our supplies of fuel with everybody else in the, room, in the building and used a communal stove to cook for meals. Because it was cold, but we couldn't, we couldn't burn anything in the stove because we didn't have enough fuel. So we just slept in the, in the clothes on most of the time. Now this camp was, uh, was, was the guards were, uh, and the camp administration, they were all Luftwaffe, right? They yes, were... they were. That's a good point, yes. They were Luftwaffe. Uh, and um, the uh, commander was Hauptmann, which was a captain. That's pretty, uh, that's the captain has a lot of authority in, in the German uh, makeup. So, uh, yeah, the cap, there was a captain there in charge. We did not have the same degree of camaraderie with the German guards as Hogan's heroes had, nothing like that. But we did have, they, we were treated very nicely. We, in fact, uh, we had, we would, uh, YWCA provided us with musical instruments, and we had concerts uh, every once in a while, and the guard would come and listen to them, and they would, uh, they, they loved our music. Uh, we had one guard who, and who wanted to go to Texas when the war was over, and so we named him Tex. He loved it, but really, they were nice guys. They, they treated us, they had their job to do, and they did it. But uh, we were, they had no... And, and they were older guys, old, weren't most they? Most of them were older, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, did you guys, uh, uh, was it all, uh, you told me that the compound was, had five, five, actually had five compounds? Five, the, the, the camp had five compounds. Camp had five compounds. Right, yes. And, and I, it, was, it was from our camp that the great escape was made. Now this was real. This was, this is not uh, anything made up by anybody, it was real. And, uh, and the, the people who escaped were primarily British um, airmen. Some were Polish, but they were with flying the British airmen. No Americans, though. No Americans. There, there were 73 of them, I believe it was, 73 who escaped through these tunnels. That's recently, it's uh, recently been found that's been the last two or three years by, um, by uh, archaeologists that there are many more tunnels there, but there are these tunnels. 73 of the fellows escaped. 20 were caught immediately and put back in, in the camp. 50 of them, and these are, this is real, this is historic fact. 50 of them were put into a barn and, and murdered on Hitler's orders. 50 of them. Yeah. Only three of the 73 got back to Allied control. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, this was of when they escaped, this was in the spring of 1944, and uh, but the war wasn't over until the summer of 45. So this was a, a almost year before the war was over, and so we had the, uh, the, an escapee would have the, all of Germany to cross uh, in the wintertime, couldn't speak the language, no food, and everybody looking for him. So we had instructors. We were not to try to, to escape. Yeah. And, and, and tell me, tell me about the Russian compound. You said that was bad well, news. Well, uh, it was bad news. I think there was a Russian compound there. We heard, and uh, we, and the word got out that we don't want to get involved with them because they're just like a bunch of animals. In other words, they they were had a very little. Uh, they didn't have the hierarchical control that we did. The our our. Um, our military, we went by our rank and and we uh, uh, followed the rank protocol, but they didn't have that apparently. So they were pretty pretty difficult to be with, and they were treated pretty badly too by the Germans, as you understand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you told us a story about the fact that you guys had a good cook. What was that all about? Okay, that's my navigator, and he had been a cook in the army. He'd been to cook in Baker School, which is a pretty good school apparently. He could tell him, you know, all the components of, of food and how you treat it and how you can do with what you can do with it. So he's an excellent cook. So we, uh, he, we uh, he was a good organizer too. And so when he first got into the camp, we he said, okay, he said he would do all the cooking, and he have one assistant, and all the rest of us would do all the all the housework in the in the, in the room. He'd keep them clean, washing dishes and things of this sort. So he uh, he took and he said he wanted all the food that came into the room. He wanted that for him. So we, we we did it. We gave him everything that came in, including our parcel food. If we anybody got any parcels from home with some food in, it went to him. 
and he was able to make nothing, something out of nothing. Uh, as I said, he uh, made a, an apple pie, one of some that tasted like apples, by using potatoes and vinegar and, and uh, uh, prunes, and he cooked a pie that tasted like apples. Now this is what he could do with what little he had. And, and you guys were getting Red Cross parcels, right? Well, this is, and we got a lot of our, lot, we got food from the Red Cross. We were supposed to get one parcel a week per person. We only got a half, and the Germans just didn't give it to us, that's all. But uh, we only got a half, so we pulled all of that, and he used it to, for the, for the uh, good of the, of the group. Of the group, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, well, I must tell you one other thing. Morale. Our morale in the room was fabulous, and we had good morale in the in the compound. Our, uh, in other words, our senior officers in the camp passed an order that we were to have a standby inspection. I didn't tell you this earlier. This is important, I think. Had a standby inspection. We complained like mad. Why in the world do we have to have a standby inspection? We're POWs. Standby inspection, and you know what that standby is. You have to clean yourself up, clean your room up, clean your bed up, and stand by your bed while somebody comes in and looks you up, head and toe, and looks at you. Well, we had this standby inspection, and we had that room spotless, and it was how we won first prize, whatever that was. Uh, our morale was tremendous as a result of this. They so. Let me, I'll say it's a principle that you cannot ever overlook. You maintain the, the, the cleanliness and, and self-respect and you'll have good morale. Yeah. Now, this was important. Yeah. Okay, didn't you tell me you guys had a, a clandestine radio too? Yes, and exactly how it got there, I was told it got, came in through by way of the, some of the sports goods that were given to us. But we did have a radio and in the Roman, the Romans, the Germans would uh, give us a radio report about where the front was. Now keep in mind this was in the, in the spring and fall of 1944. I must go back for something in just a minute. In the summer of 1944, I looked up, heard an airplane overhead, and I looked up and I saw an airplane, not where I thought it should be, but way on over. It was the first jet I'd ever seen. They had a jet. In 1944, the only thing about it, they didn't have enough um, uh, uh, um, a time for it to fly, enough capacity of, of fuel, but it was that fast. If they had a bunch of jets, we'd lost the war. Yeah. But okay, uh, where was I? Um, You're talking about, well, that was the ME-262, right? I think so, yes, yeah. so a twin okay. engine, yes. Yeah, okay, we're talking about the cl clandestine radio. Oh yeah, the radio. So the Germans would give us the, their report on the front, where the front was, but we'd hear our radio and it was different from the, what the front said. So that, that also improved our morale. So we had pretty darn good morale there. Yeah, and you guys had roll call twice a day? Yeah, it was called Appel. Seven, I think it was seven or eight o'clock in the morning and five in the afternoon, you know, twice a day. And we'd fall out, and we'd, and we'd, meaning we'd meet out on the parade ground and uh, each barracks would stand in, as a group and when the ca the captain would come by, he would count heads. We'd come to attention, and this was you know, part of the protocol. And uh, he'd count us all, and he, he was, this was done to see if anybody tried to escape. And I think only a couple of times people had done that, so there was a notice when when it happened. Did you guys ever try to fake them out by having moving around well, in your formation? So, yeah, one, I think once in a while it happened, but that it wouldn't be very successful. Yeah. You also uh, you also said you had uh, one one of the one of the guys that was uh, was a Jewish uh, a Jewish officer. Yes, he was. He was a navigator, very smart man. Spoke seven languages and was studying Russian while he was there, just because he likes languages. But he was a wonderful man, just wonderful. He was, of course, he was. Uh, had, his name was Greenwald, and that's a Jewish name. And he had he had the parents of. Uh, of a Jewish man, and so anyway, he just um, he knew he knew that they knew who he was. But when we were on one of our marches, on our biggest march from the from Stalag Three, he used his German talents, speaking talents, to get help for all the guys who were falling by the wayside and 
and can carry the loads and so forth. And he did an immeasurably good job of taking care of it. So he was a wonderful man, yeah. a wonderful man. You guys also got uh, sports equipment and stuff like that from the Red Cross, musical instruments? From YWCA. YWCA. Yeah, that, they're the one that brought that in. We had a, uh, I think it was a 14 or 16 piece band and we had, had ice skates. I learned to ice skate over there. We flooded the, the wall, the, uh, the ground outside of our barracks and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, I learned to ice skate. <laughs> Didn't do a good job, but I learned anyway. You know, I could just see all you guys skating around there. You weren't, you weren't in no grab ass or anything like that, was there? No, no, uh, no. Okay, uh, somewhere along the line, uh, they, they they decided to evacuate the camp. I guess the Russians were getting close. Okay, we could we had been hearing the Russian guns at night. We could hear them, so we knew something was going on. And and also we had been sort of forewarned that we might uh, have have to move. Uh, we had also been, we were told also that uh, uh, that Hitler might have us all shot instead of moving us. Uh, we later learned that yes, he had issued that order, but the German generals wouldn't wouldn't go along with it. But we are, were ordered to move out. So one one night, this was on the early in, in January of 1945, we started our march. We called it a march, really, it was just a walk. We, uh, got, we were told in the, about noon to we were moving out that night, so we tore our bed sheets up and made ropes out of it, for, and we made backpacks and, and took our whatever food and belongings we had and made packs for ourselves and dressed warmly, took all of our clothing we had, and we started out about, oh, 12.30 or something like that the next morning. We walked all that next day, all that night, all the next day, all the next night, and I forget whether we were on two nights. I think like it was two nights we were out. But um, I had two two incidents happen that uh, this made me feel have an entirely different attitude about the German people. Uh, one of these nights, the a lady came out. At the, this is about one o'clock in the morning, with a pitcher of hot water, and poured hot water into our cups and let us drink it. It was like drinking nectar. It was that good. We were thirsty and tired and hungry at all the same time. Then another time I stopped and went and knocked on a lady's door. She let me in her her house and she had one of these beautiful German stoves in the corner, you know, the ceramic stoves, and gave me some uh, some uh, potato soup, which is with nothing but water and potatoes. But it was mighty good. It was hot and it was it was uh, had some substance. And she let me listen to her radio on the BBC. So uh, they, the German people were not um, angry with us. Yeah, yeah. They were also worried about the Russians that were coming yes, they were. the other yes, direction. They, yes, they were. Yeah. And they were there. This was in that in the eastern part of, of Germany. Yeah. When this happened. Okay. Uh, did anybody try to escape while you were? Uh, one evening, on one of these evenings, we were on this road. The road. Now, this was one of the coldest winters that they had had in that area. We were walking on the the snow-packed road. And uh, a team of forces apparently was running away, pulling a wagon. And so we jumped over to the side and some of the guys uh, <clears throat> uh, decided they'd try to escape. They ran into the woods and the guards saw them, of course, and started shooting. And I think they were shooting above their head, but started shooting. And the rest of us lay on the ground to get out of the way of the bullets. And I can remember lying there in the cold snow, trying to burrow into that snow best I could and thinking, wonder if that, that back I had I have would stop a bullet. Well it could have wouldn't have, but uh, nevertheless uh, I got over that. But then that happened. Yeah. Did they finally load you guys on some trains though? You didn't you... Well we went to we we got to Shemnitz. I believe that's where it was. The Shemnitz and had a rest for about two or three days to sort of recuperate from the walk. And then they they started moving us again and um, World War One was famous for its 40 and 8 boxcars. That uh, those boxcars were made to hold 40 men or eight horses. So you can get an idea of how large they were. But the, the, we had 52 of us, 52 POWs, and one guard on each car. So we were very badly overloaded. But we so we uh, used our blankets and made slings and slung hammocks and so forth. And uh, 
so it alleviated the, the, the space yeah. situation somewhat. Okay, so you ended up down close to Nuremberg then, right? Yeah, we went Ultimately. to Nuremberg. We went to Nuremberg, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, somewhere along the line, uh, uh, one of our guys almost got you, right? A night fighter or a night bomber or something like that? Well, um, uh, no, this is not, no, I, we never had any attack. We, we knew, okay, we would, on the train, we would have, there have a, an air raid alert. So the, we would, the train would stop, the guard would lock the cars, I'll lock us in it, and go off run to the, the shelter. But no, we did not have an attack, but apparently they knew we were there. Yeah. The, uh, the only night fighter we, that I remember seeing was the one uh, out of Nuremberg at the day we were leaving. He huh. saw it attacking a target okay. in Nuremberg. Okay, so now Easter Sunday, 1945. Correct. That's the day we started moving from Nuremberg for the 100 kilometer trip to Mooseburg. Now, now I can't ever equate a kilometer to a mile, but uh, I think it's a little less than a mile. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. But uh, 100 kilometers and we had 10 days as a piece of cake. We, we walked and 10 miles a day is, you know, not much. And we uh, also had a lot of freedom in it. We had our back, had our, our uh, rations that we, from our Red Cross parcels, that was included uh, chocolate and cigarettes and with those things you could buy anything yeah, yeah. so we we got food and we lived pretty nicely on the way to got to do mooseburg and we stayed in tents at news mooseburg because it was so crowded there and uh, i remember i was lying in, in in there and and we heard uh, on sunday morning the 29th of april we heard small small arms fire coming in over the, the top of the hill and and uh, looked over there and there was the tanks coming down and so they came down the hill and hit the front gates and burst on through and put the American flag up and we all started crying and the Red Cross crows were there and Pat was right there behind them yeah and I was walking right beside the man yeah yeah I could have kissed him but he wouldn't let me yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was part of the uh, 14th Armored Division I think that actually was, liberated yeah. the camp okay. and what had happened I guess they'd moved all the POWs from all the prison camps all over Germany and they all ended up there at Mooseburg well that could be because this was that that this is a barbed wire tent a tent community yeah yeah so you that, guys weren't happy or anything like that were you <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you something. Did did uh, did they immediately provide you guys with medical care and, and stuff like okay. that? Tell me how that worked. Okay, but well, first, the very first thing, uh, we got some white bread. German bread is horrible. We got they brought some white bread and gave it to us. That the our troops did, and uh, uh, brought us some kind of food supplies. Uh, but we, because of the number of people there, uh, we uh, we did not get any any immediate, immediate treatment, I would presume that people who needed medical treatment did get some. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my immediate group we didn't. But we were held there for a while and then taken to Landshut, which is right close to Mooseburg, and put on C-46s and flown to uh, Lucky Strike. Uh, there are some, I think it's Lucky Strike. Lucky Strike, yeah. yeah. Camp Lucky Strike. And uh, now, and, I'm, and uh, my geography is, is uh, weak here, but I remember going through Paris on the train from wherever we landed to have a meal. And I remember I, remember I would like to, uh, I wanted to go to Paris and see what Paris was like. They had our guards on the train, wouldn't let us go on the train. They'd you go eat and then come back on the train. Because had we been let loose, we'd have probably killed ourselves eating. <laughs> well, this well, really, listen, how, was you, how was your health? I mean, were you guys relatively healthy or? We were all we, relatively healthy. I lost about, a, about, well, I weighed 155 pounds when I got out of there. So, and I weighed 200, I weighed 200 when I went in. So that was about that. Yeah. But um, yeah, we, 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 were, we were all pretty healthy, yes. Yeah. Because we had been, we'd gotten good treatment in, in the Americans. Now, so, Camp, go ahead. Oh, that was it. Uh, Camp Lucky Strike. That was a uh, 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 where they where they uh, collected the guys that were going home, and it was also where they brought replacements in that okay. were coming in. So I, I guess yeah. Yeah, I and they, and there were several of those camps. There was Camp Lucky Strike and Camel and Chesterfield and 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 oh, and, yeah. okay. and they and that and that's what that was. 
Right, okay. Well, yeah. a lucky strike was good. Now, they took our, our clothing away from us and uh, gave us uh, 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 the ODs, you know, the, uh, the green. Uh, yeah. Oh, they deloused us. Yeah, sure. Now, we didn't have any lice problems, we, um, uh, our group. But lysing, louse, what's the problem? Louses? I know <laughs> lice were a problem. To people, to a lot yeah. of them. and it's yeah. uh, pretty serious. Yeah. We didn't have the problem, but yeah. we were given some money. How much money do you want? And yeah, we could make a draw on our pay. Remember, we had a year's pay coming to us. Yeah. So you could make a draw on your pay, and they gave us a uh, letter to write. I sent a wire home, and I, I sent the wire to my mother, and to my to my fiance Rob's mother, Rob's mother, uh, who was we were just engaged then, that I was okay and I'd be on my way home. But they didn't let you go in and terrorize in Paris. No, they didn't. <laughs> but but we did. Now, interesting thing, which I didn't mention, we were at. Um, um, okay, where was the, where was the armistice signed? Um, you mean the name Versa was Versailles? Versailles? No, uh, no. We were in the town, of where the where the papers were signed. Oh, okay. I forget it offhand. Yeah. Um, I know. I don't it was right close to Lucky Strike. Yeah. And we yep. were, I was in, I was yep. downtown, and we'll talk, talk about a celebration. Talking about medical for a second, let me go back and ask you about your medical care that you got while you were in the camp. Okay, uh, I got none. I didn't need any. Uh, we did have uh, a couple of, of the guys, one of them had his arm, uh, lost some fingers and had his arm pretty badly uh, uh, cut out, shot up. And he was expatriated, expa 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 I think. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was uh, gotten, they got him out. Yeah. And a few people like that, but we did not have any major medical problems. Yeah. We were fortunate. Yeah. And no no disease, no cholera, no, no, nothing no, like that. No, we didn't. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now you're in Camp Lucky Strike. What happens next? Well, uh, we got, we got, don't get us in our wires home. Took a gross of money. Uh, got on. I got on a boat. Uh, see, it wasn't a victory ship. It was another kind, another name for that for that type. And went to Boston. Uh, I forget the exact date. Went to Boston and debarked there, and but then put on went by uh, a train to um, um, town in Indiana, which was our demilitarizing uh, yeah. Yeah. town. And out of Louisville, and got on a bus there, and went to first went to my fiance's house and met her, and this was oh what a beautiful reunion that was. Yeah. Uh, she didn't she knew I was coming, but didn't know when. I didn't have any idea. When. And then I called my sister. My mother didn't have a phone. I called my sister, and went out to see her, and then went to see mama and by my father and brother, and we did a lot of crying. Yeah, I'm sure. And you I did. was glad to get home, and and um, so so. so and you know, I look back and I think about the pain and suffering they went through. Think about me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let me let me. Uh, um, so so you ended up staying in the Air Force. So I got out. I, I stayed in for a while, and then and we got my wife and I got married. Got out uh, uh, shortly thereafter, and uh, and I wanted to go to school, which I did. And I was almost through law school. I had one semester to go. And uh, I got recalled. I was in the Air National Guard, and I liked the military, so I stayed in and finished there. Yeah. Okay. For how, how long? Tw well, I was uh, 25. I was total 20 years active duty, but 25 years total yeah. military service. Yeah. And retired as a lieutenant colonel. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's not. That's not bad. For, for a young kid that uh, <laughs> hopped in the front seat of a B-17 as a second <laughs> lieutenant and started flying that sucker around Europe. Okay, well, tell me some more war stories. Uh, well, I haven't got any more written down. You you've taken okay, it. Okay, uh, let me see if I can think of any others. So. Did did uh, um, so you didn't have any hard feelings? Oh yeah, I got one. Yes, flak. Flak was always scary. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you two on flak. Uh, uh, remember, we flew formation. We can, we, you can see airplanes ahead of us. And I saw one airplane, fully loaded with bombs, get a direct hit and blew up in front of me. 
and I had to fly through his debris, and I could see blood on the windshield. Uh. That was that was, that was heart wrenching. It really was. And another time, uh, uh, I hear again the Lord was with me. I'm flying along, fat, dumb, and happy, and a shell comes up and bursts right above my astrodome, right above my nose. Just, if you look at the timing, a split second off and it hit me. It burst right up here and a piece of the flak about the size of my finger came through over this, through the scan of the airplane, which is very thin, a bone top, and hit me on the parachute strap. And I said, oh boy, oh boy, I got the purple heart. I didn't have anything like it. It didn't even hurt me, just stuck there. <laughs> but that was the closest thing. And you didn't bring it home with you. Didn't bring it home with you. You didn't bring it home with you. Well, you were telling me also uh, when you guys were getting ready to bail out, you were really worried about your ball turret gunner, weren't you? Oh, it was. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being in a ball turret and everybody's, everybody else is gone and you're going down with the airplane and getting out of it? I mean, I think that'd be horrible. I don't think I could have lived if that had happened, yeah. if I had been like I was and he, and, and he didn't get out. Yeah. So I, I was I felt very strongly about. So the minute I knew that we had to get out, I, I called back on the intercom and said, "Get the, get him, get Vaslik out of that ball." Yeah, because that wasn't easy to get out of that no, ball no, dirt, was he, it? He was in a fetal position all the time, and he had to fire his guns through his knees, and he couldn't even put his parachute on because see they had the snap-on parachutes. He didn't have enough room to put his parachute on in there. He had to come up, climb out, and get his parachute. Yeah. And you had to keep you had to keep the plane straight and level, so so right that those it. guys could get out. Because if you started spinning or anything like that, the that centrifugal force would have right. they wouldn't have been able to get out. That's right. We all had to do that. So yeah, uh, this is how it was, and we were scared. And, and oh, I was so I was so fortunate that I've had so many blessings yeah. on this thing. So yeah. very many. And you, I'm thankful for it. You, you, you passed up a lot of good chances to get killed, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Well, listen, uh, Mr. Hicks, thank you again for uh, participating in this project. Uh, I think you're going to be happy with the result. Well, well, this has been a fabulous story. Well, thank you for and, your uh, help. And uh, I want to thank you also for serving your country because you sure did. Well, you all did too. Shoot, we, Rob did too. My son did. He, he was a, a ground pounder in the Air Force and, and uh, he. What's that? Uh, that uh, what did you do, Rob? The uh, he was missiles. Yeah, the missile. He was the missile yeah. watcher yeah. kind of thing. We call them cone heads in the army. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's well, about right. <laughs> no, it's not about right. Anyway. Well, listen, I want to thank you and well, thank you uh, for, thank uh, you for this, doing this, doing it for me. It's our our pleasure. Okay, thank you.